And everybody said, Amen. I welcome you to our Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. And I pray that the blessings of studying the word will be upon every one of us. Amen. Will encourage us, strengthen us, Amen. comfort us, Amen. and lead us in the right direction in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. Thank you for your people here. Thank you for those who have been coming for years and years. They have kept up the interest and are interested in knowing more in the word of God, in the will of God. I pray, Lord, you refresh every one of us tonight in Jesus' name. We well, thank you for those who are coming for the first time. We pray that you'll simplify the word for everyone so that everyone will have benefits from your word in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for our brothers and sisters, and for our members, and for our young people, our youth. Thank you for uh, the youth um, success camp we just finished. And thank you for the breakthrough. Thank you for the outpouring of your blessing. I will pray that all these uh, young people, they grow up to become leaders and champions in the faith, in the future, in Jesus' name. Thank you for our children. Our children who love the word and love the Lord. And they are coming together with us every Monday like this. I pray, Lord, that your blessing will enrich them as well. Amen. Bless every family. Amen. Bless us in every local church. Amen. And bless all the locations where we're hearing your word right now. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would love a better year by Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. You can see now. We're coming to our systematic study of the Word of God. We say it's systematic because we go from chapter to chapter and from verse to verse. Then we say it is expository because we expose everything in the Word of God. As we look at all the verses, we look at all the verses that also compare with these verses we're reading. And I pray that the expository, systematic study of the word will benefit everyone tonight in Jesus' name. We're coming to chapter 8 and we're reading from verse 1. Chapter 8, reading from verse 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. Why don't you stop there for a moment? As we look at this chapter, it opens with connection with the previous chapter. And Lord Jesus Christ redeemed the time because the days were evil. After the events of chapter 7, immediately he went out. And he went onto the Mount of Olives. What's that teaching us? It means that between chapter 7 and chapter 8, nothing was lost. No time is lost. No effort is lost. Why did he then go to the Mount of Olives at this time? Number one, for solitude. You see, when you are in the crowd all the time, and you are interacting with everybody all the time, you lose quite a lot. But as he finished all the discussion, all the preaching, all the teaching in the previous chapter, he went to the Mount, number one, for solitude. Number two, for meditation. Meditation. You meditate in the Word of God, and you have to do that time by time after time so that the richness of the word of god riches of the word of god will be in your life number three for inventory inventory that means you, you look at what you've done in the past you know you're walking and walking and walking and then you take the time off that you are by yourself now is this right is this wrong is that the way i should have done that is this contributing to my mission is it helping at all and then number four it was for prayer he went so that he could receive strength again they that wait upon the lord shall renew their strength and it is for re renewal they need to renew his strength and for reflection you are thinking you are reflecting you know, where do we go next what do we do next it is when you take time off like that you're able to have that kind of re reflection and then for refreshing it refreshes you it makes you come back again all the weariness and the dreary and everything is vanished away and you are refreshed we must always find time to recharge our batteries many of us here 
have the experience of using a telephone and use it over and over and over and then because you're using it all the time and it's serving you the battery is running down but you need to charge the battery the same thing in our lives we're using our strength our power our intelligence and everything we've got and then we go back to the lord after walking and walking and walking to recharge our batteries otherwise life and ministry can become dull can become dreary can become eventually dead like the telephone gets dead if you just use over and over and you never recharge it again and i pray god will keep us wisdom that as we're living our lives we are recharging your batteries every time in jesus name did i have an amen in the house we're looking at look at verse 2 it says early in the morning look at that after he had done all that we spoke about now because they went to the mount of olives it says early in the morning he came again into the temple and what was he did look at verse 2 there it says he came to the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and what did he do he taught them he taught them but you notice the words early in the morning notice the word temple and notice the word he taught them there are many people that think that we only teach the word of god in the evening they do not understand that every moment is for the teaching of the word of god every opportunity is for the teaching of the word of god the time is short and life is brief and if the most important the most urgent work is pointing people to heaven we must not lose time daily we must do it early we must do it and we'll find jesus example that he taught he preached and he directed sinners to their salvation and he directed the disciples to holiness and to heaven and let's look at uh, other parts of scripture it tells us in chapter 21 of luke luke chapter 21 uh, we're reading from verse 30 reading from verse 36 luke chapter 21 and we're reading from verse 36 it says in verse 36 watch ye therefore and pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the son of man look at verse 37 and in the day time he was teaching in the temple and at night he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came, tell me, all the people came early in the morning to him in the temple for to hear him. They came to learn, they came to listen, and they came to see the way of heaven. And that's what Jesus Christ did early in the morning. He'll go to the temple, and he was not doing this just once in a while. He did this every time. Look at uh, chapter 19. Chapter 19, uh, I'm reading from verse 47. Chapter 19, verse 47. Please open your Bible. We're studying the Bible. Chapter, tell me the chapter. And then the verse... 47 and he taught them tell me the next word there daily you see that he taught them early in the morning and he taught them daily in the temple he taught them every time and he lost no time at all have you noticed that the disciples of jesus christ also follow that pattern because it, they must follow his example and if we are disciples of the lord jesus christ we follow his pattern as well we're looking at acts of the apostles chapter 5 Acts chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 19. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 5, verse 19, it says, But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Look at what the angel told them. He said they had been in prison because of the preaching of the word. They were persecuted. And now they brought them out and he said, number one, go. Number two, stand. Number three, speak in the temple. In the temple. And then it goes on to say to the people, all the words of this life. Look at verse 21. And when they had that, they entered into the temple. When? Early in the morning. They entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. 
they follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you understand that Jesus Christ taught early in the morning. Not only early in the morning, he did that daily. Look at these disciples. Now look at verse 42. In verse 42, and daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus. They actually follow the pattern of Jesus, the practice of Jesus, and you will follow. And I will follow. And we will all follow the practice, the pattern of Jesus, and we'll do that in Jesus' name. We're coming back to John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, already we have looked at verses 1 and 2, and we have seen the implication for us. We have seen uh, the instruction for us. We have seen the pattern, the example for us. Jesus went uh, onto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. Verse 3, and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, and then it continues. You see, these scribes and these Pharisees they didn't want uh, people to hear the word of God. You know what they did here? They interrupted the teaching of Christ. They interrupted the ministry of Christ. They interrupted the mission of Christ. All they wanted to do was to divert the attention of the people away from the teaching. And you think about these religious people and these these uh, uh, enemies of righteousness, enemies of the teaching of the Lord. And uh, they came early in the morning. They were looking for something they can bring and then tell Jesus. And then all the other people that were listening to the Lord Jesus Christ were returned away from what he was saying, what he was teaching. But you know what Jesus did? He turned their rude interruption to divine intervention. That's why I would say Jesus had great wisdom. I pray God will give us wisdom. He turned interruption to intervention. Intervention. They would have killed that woman and they would have taken laws into their hands and to destroy life. And they used that to interrupt the ministry of Jesus Christ. But divine intervention came. You know, when you are linked up with Jesus Christ, every interruption in your life will be turned to intervention. And then they, they wanted to condemn her. But Jesus turned condemnation to conversion condemnation to conversion the devil would like to accuse you and, and confuse you and the people of the world would like to condemn you but every condemnation it will turn to a construction in your life positive construction powerful con uh, con con uh, construction that in this case it turned the condemnation into conversion tonight we're looking at this whole passage and the topic is the shining light of the savior's wisdom the shining light of the Savior's wisdom. You'll find here how Jesus Christ was wise. And he applied that wisdom to save a life, to save a soul. And then to drive away all those accusers and all those enemies of the truth and enemies of righteousness. We're coming to chapter 8. Let's look at the, at the, the verses we're looking at today now. It says in verse 3, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery. In the very act, now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Moses commanded us, and we are following Moses. We are following the word of God, and we are following line after line, precept after precept. We are faithful to the word of God, and this woman marries to be killed, and we're going to stone, and we're going to stone her, but want to hear what she say. Look at verse 6. This they said, tell me. Did they want, uh, they didn't really want to obey the scriptures? No, it was not to obey the scriptures. It was not to uh, kind of uh, say, we're following the word of God. And because we're righteous, we're going to heaven. We're going to be everything the Lord, the word of God has said. This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. 
that they might have to accuse him. They wanted to get something that they can hold and accuse him and then condemn him. But Jesus took down and with his finger wrote on the ground uh, as though he had them not. As though he had them not. Praise the Lord. Amen. God will give you wisdom. It's not everything you hear, you respond to. Otherwise, your, your life will be scattered. This one comes, and that one comes, and that one comes. And they say this, and they, they say that. And they even hook it with the scriptures, with the Bible. And then you are responding to that. God will give you wisdom. He was writing on the ground as though he had them not. So, when they continued asking him, he lifted off himself and said... He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience. These people that are accusing the woman, were they perfect people? Were they righteous people? Were they heavenly minded people? No, they were sinners themselves. And it says they were convicted by their own conscience. And they went out one by one, beginning at the elders, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone. And uh, the woman standing uh, in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those non accusers? As no man condemned thee she said no man lord and jesus said unto her tell me out loud neither do i condemn thee go and sin no more as i said we're looking at the shining light of the savior's wisdom we're dividing the passage to three parts number one a wicked attempt a wicked attempt to confound the savior a wicked attempt to confound the Savior. Number two is wise answer to convict the schemers. Is wise answer to convict the schemers. Number three, the wonderful assurance for converted souls. The wonderful assurance for converted souls. Number one, a wicked attempt to confound the Savior. You see these people, scribes and Pharisees, this was their full-time job. They were always looking for ways to discredit the Lord Jesus Christ. They were not sincere people. They were hypocritical. They were mischievous. And they were downright evil. You look at their intention. Look at verse 6. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. This they said, tempting him uh, that they might have to accuse him. What was their intention bringing a woman like this in the midst of the teaching, in the middle of the session of teaching the people, showing them the way to life eternal? It was to discredit Jesus. It was to criticize Jesus. It was to condemn Jesus. You see, they wanted to condemn him. What does that mean? You listen to what was said again. It says in verse, in verse 4, they said unto him, Master, they called him Master. You know, sometimes when people flatter you, you think they are honoring you. When they say Master, when they say leader, when they say teacher, when they say preacher, when they say pastor, when they call you by a particular title, and then you're all ears to say, Yes, I am. I want to hear. Be very careful and don't give in to people that just come to flatter you because they, they throw the bait at you so that you can swallow that and then they get you. They will not get you. This woman was taking adultery in the very act. And now, they have not finished. They, just, they said, this was done. Then they didn't leave that in the master's hand. They said, now, Moses and the Lord commanded us, commanded us, commanded us, we should assault, should be stoned, that is stoned to death. And then they said, what sayest thou? Look at verse 6. This, the sage. I said, this, the sage tempting him uh, that they might have uh, to accuse him. You see what they should have done? Uh, Jesus could have said either yes or no. That's what they were expecting. They said, now this is what Moses said. 
She was taken in this terrible act. And Moses said, stone her. What do you say? It's either yes, stone her, or no, don't stone her. If she said, yes, stone her, they will accuse him of uh, not having love, not having mercy. You see now, he said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. It's not true. Look at it now. He said, we should stone her. So if, she's, if he said yes, they will condemn him. If he said no, they will say, everybody you have heard is not worth Moses. We are following Moses, and it's against Moses. And so since it's against Moses, anybody against Moses, against the whole of the Old Testament, he rejects Genesis to uh, Malachi. And you're going to be listening to him. You don't have to listen to a man like that. And so if he said no, don't do it, he has contradicted Moses. If he said yes, do it, then they said there is no love. And so he didn't say yes. He didn't say no. You see, many of us were quick to answer people, and sometimes they put the question straight at us, yes or no. And then you say yes, they say, there you are. You say no, they say, there you are. God will give you wisdom. Yeah. I say, God will give you wisdom. Yeah. Your life will be preserved. Yeah. And when you look at society, something happens in society. It's in the bus, they meet you. And it's in the on the train, they meet you. On the taxi, they meet you. And they want to just rob you in. Which one do you go? And then you say, this is what I go. I've been thinking about a question for a long time. And I know you are going to help me. Because I know that those you people, you know the Bible from cover to cover. Now you are ready. You are sucking in their bait and their uh, line. And then they say, hi about this, hi about this. Oh, you say, that's very simple. They say, according to yes according to no and then they've got you they will not get you so jesus christ used wisdom one they wanted to condemn him they wanted to criticize him number two they wanted to contradict and destroy his ministry because he was ministering to people it's not after, it's not only after him they were after his ministry they wanted to confuse the sinners and they wanted to convince those sinners you want to listen to him okay anything you do he says they should stone you if you do this you are dead if you do this you are dead that was their intention they would have accused him of not really following the word of god and look at uh, john chapter 18 john chapter 18 i'm reading from verse 31 john chapter 18 verse 31 then pilate said unto them taking him and judge him according to your law the jews said therefore said unto him it is not lawful for us to put any man to death look at them now they said it's not lawful for us whatever the person has done it's not lawful for us to put any man to death and they were asking jesus should they put her to death and they knew that was not lawful for them because they were under the roman government and if somebody has done something they're not going to put that person to death in their temple in their sin because that will be mob jungle justice and that kind of jungle justice will be punished by the government but they wanted to get jesus into that kind of situation and then if he contradicted moses look at acts of the apostles chapter 6 and verse 11 acts of the apostles chapter 6 verse 11 it says in chapter 6 verse 11 then the suburban men which said we have heard him that is had stephen speak blasphemous words against moses and against god that's what they were looking for. On the one hand, it's against the Roman government. On the one hand, it doesn't have love. It doesn't have mercy, no compassion. Stone her, let her die. On the other hand, they wanted her to speak against Moses. You will not get into their niche. Uh, these uh, Pharisees and scribes, let's look at them uh, briefly. We're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, uh, and I'm reading from verse 12. Matthew chapter 12, we're reading from verse 12. In verse 12, it says, How much? Uh, Matthew chapter 12, reading from verse 12. Uh, you know, he had done, uh, you know, a miracle here. And then after he has done the miracle, uh, from chapter from verse 12, they look at verse 14. Then uh, the Pharisees went out and they held a counsel against him, how they might destroy him. 
they held the counsel against him how they might destroy him look at verse 15 but when jesus knew it he would draw he would drew himself from there he knew whenever they came they were coming to tent and they were coming to get him into trouble they were not coming for salvation they were not coming for instruction they were not coming for righteousness they were not coming for wanting to know the way to heaven look at chapter 16 i'm reading from verse 1 the pharisees also or the sadducees came what were they doing tempting him tempting him they tempted him again tempting him and look at uh, that one it says and desired him that will show them a sign from heaven look at uh, verse 4 a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet jonas look at verse 6 then jesus said unto them take it and beware of the leaven of the pharisees and the scribes so you see that every time they came they had something in mind they wanted to tame jesus they wanted to distract the attention of the people from the ministry of jesus we're coming to mark chapter 10 mark chapter 10 we're reading from verse 2 mark chapter 10 reading from verse 2 and the pharisees came to him and asked him are you there what did he say is it lawful for a man to put away his wife stop there for a moment the many of us you're eager to answer such a question yes yes i, I can answer you and then you go from genesis the purpose of marriage and then uh, the plan of marriage and the promise of marriage and the doctrine of marriage that this is what the lord had said let them learn why are they asking the question is it an hypothetical question is it a question of supposition is it a question just to us so that they can distract attention from uh, the thing we're doing and from the message that is being given look at that again the pharisees came to him and asked him is it lawful for a man to put away his wife tell me what follows tempting him tempting him so it's not every question we respond to because if they want to tempt if they just want to you to talk so that they can you can be diverted from the real topic and the real thing you're dealing with we must be wise like jesus was wise i pray that the wisdom of jesus will pass on to you in jesus name we're looking at Mark chapter 11 Mark chapter 11 we're reading from verse uh, we're reading from verse 17 mark chapter 11 reading from verse 17 and he taught saying unto them is it not written my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer but she have made it a den of thieves and the scribes and the chief priests had it and they sought how they might destroy him for they feared him because all the people was astonished at his doctrine did you see they wanted to destroy him it was effective it was uh, capturing the minds of the people and the people were following after him and they were jealous of his victory they were jealous of his success they were jealous of the teaching he was given they were jealous of his ministry and so they found a way to destroy him but they could not they will not destroy you mark chapter 12 we're reading from verse 13 mark chapter 12 from verse 13 and they and they sent unto him certain pharisees and of, and of the herodians to catch him in his words you see that it's not to learn it's not to change their lives it's not to repent it's not to believe in him it's not to find the narrow way that leads to heaven and to get to heaven to catch him in his words and look at what he said now and when they were come they said unto him master you know when they do that you don't know that they have a wrong intention bad intention and a bad purpose i pray that you'll discover it every time when they were come to him they say unto him master we know that thou art true and carest for no man 
for thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Now the question, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or no? And here's the question, you either say yes or you say no. Is it lawful to give a tribute to Caesar or no? If you say yes, uh -huh, that means that he has made the Romans to be our Lord. And God said, we are the light of the world. And we are to have the preeminence and dominance over the people. This gentile nation, they really know about us. And it's affirming that uh, Caesar is our king. If he said no, then they report to Caesar that this man is rebellious, is treacherous. He doesn't want us to pay homage or to do anything to you. Because of that, he didn't say yes and he didn't say no. Because he knew their mind. Look at verse, uh, look at verse, 12, verse 15. Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, he, knowing the hypocrisy said unto them, why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny at the time a seed, and they brought it. And he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And he said unto him, Caesar's. Jesus answering said unto them, Read unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. I pray God will give you wisdom. So that all these people that come and they want to destabilize you and ruin your ministry and ruin your life, they, they turn every opportunity, they turn the opportunity to something to distract people, to destroy people, and to discredit the ministry. But Jesus overcame every time. And I'm looking at overcomers there today. You'll overcome every time in Jesus' name. Let's come back to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. We'll come to point number 2 now. His wise answer to convict the schemers. The wise answer that he gave convicted the schemers. We're reading from John chapter 8 and we're reading from verse 6. This the search tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his fingers and wrote on the ground as though he had them not. Verse 7, so when he continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that, are, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Verse 9, and they went, and they which had it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. You see here, we have number one, his wise action. Number two, his wise approach. Number three is wise attitude. Number four is wise answer. Number five is wise admonition. Number one is wise action. What kind of action? He heard what he said. He did not respond. He kept quiet. Was silent about it. And was writing on the ground. As if he had them not. They wanted to discredit him and destroy his ministry, destroy his message, and destroy his mission. But his wise action defeated them and distinguished him as having mastery. In triumphant quietness, his hearers saw him. He had no fear for those Pharisees. He had no fury, no anger for those Pharisees. He had no anxiety, no worry. As if they have come to get me, and now they ask a question like this, they are going to destroy my ministry. All these people have heard now, what am I going to say now? Maybe I should look for the passages to quote in the Old Testament that will support this and support that. He was just quiet and silent. There was no fretting, no fretting, no fear, no fury, no anger, no anxiety. And that action destabilized them. 
and defeated them. They didn't know what to do. And they kept on asking and asking and putting pressure. It's wise approach. A wise approach. They're wanting to divert the attention of the people from his teaching, from the word of God. You know what he did? He diverted the attention away from the woman to themselves. He said, leave the woman alone. Let's think about you. Look at your life. You're perfect. You're righteous. You're sinless. You're spotless. You're so pure. You've never committed any sin. He that has no sin, let him cast the false stone. That approach destabilized them, diverting their attention from the woman to themselves. Is wise attitude. You see, the attitude it was peaceful and poised. It was calm. It was cool. There was no agitation and there was no fear at all in his action. That attitude of being peaceful and poised on the persecution gave assurance to those who were learning the heavenly truth and the heavenly way from his teaching. They said, this is the real master. See him, he's not agitated. See him, he's poised. See him, he's cool and calm. And eventually when he spoke out, his wise answer brought undeniable conviction on the accusers, not on the woman. The woman was just a poor sinner because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the sinner needs salvation. And that woman needed salvation, needed the mercy of God, and needed the love of God. But these accusers themselves, they were secret sinners. And Jesus Christ exposed them and he said, ah, you are the righteous people. And he that has no sin among you, let him cast the false stone. His wise admonition confirmed his teaching and serves as warning as we approach the judgment day. Let's come back to John chapter, chapter 8 and we're looking at verse 6. John chapter 8, we're reading from verse 6. It says in verse 6, this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down. And with his finger wrote on the ground as though, as though, as though he had them not. Did he hear them? I said, did he hear them? Did he hear the question? And then he just went on as if he did not hear. You know, sometimes you have to do that. You have to do that. Look at Psalm 38. We're looking at Psalm 38. And we're reading from verse 12. Psalm 38, verse 12. 12. It says, they also that seek after my life, lay snares for me. That's what they came to do. And they that seek my heart, speak mischievous things, and imagine disease all the day long. But I, as a deaf man, had not. And I was as a dumb man that opened not his mouth. Thus, I was as a man that heareth not, and in whose mouth are no reproofs. So the psalmist said, that's what I do. They're mischievous, they're evil, they want to destroy, and they want to get rid of me. I hear what they're saying. I, hear, I know what they're doing, but I'm like a dumb man. I'm like a dead man. I refuse to see. I refuse to listen. God will give you wisdom. Look at Psalm 39, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 39, verses 1 and 2. I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle, while the wicked is before me. It says, when the wicked come, and they're standing before me, they want me agitated, they want me angry, they want me furious, they want me to fret, they want me to fear, they want me to say the wrong thing, and they you know, say something, say something, say Say something. I know the wicked are before me, and I keep my mouth with a bridle. Look at verse 2. I was dumb or silence. I held my peace, even from the good, and my sorrow was stirred. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. Look at this prophet and see the favor of God upon his life and see what God did for him. I pray I'll do this for you. 
I said he'll do this for you. Ezekiel chapter 3, we're reading from verse 26. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 26. And I will make thy tongue, this is the Almighty God saying, this is what he will do for Ezekiel. I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth, that thou shalt be dumb, and shall not be to them a reprover, a reprover, for they are a rebellious house. Verse 26 says, Ezekiel, these people, they are rebellious. And they don't want the word of God. And they come to you. They just want to tempt you. They want to try. They want to destroy you. But I'm going to do something for you. I'll make your tongue to cleave to the roof of your mouth when they are before you. But look at verse 27. But when I speak with thee, when I give you the word, when I give you the word of wisdom, when I give you the word of salvation, when I give you the word that will change their lives, when I give you the word that will reveal my will, but when I speak with you, I will open thy mouth and thou shalt say unto them thus says the lord god he that heareth let him hear and he that forbeareth let him forbear for they are a rebellious house so that's what jesus did at the time he ought to keep quiet he kept quiet he will not say anything he was dumb as if he didn't hear what he was saying let's come back to john chapter 8 i'm reading from verses 7 and 8 john chapter 8 verse 7 so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast his stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. You see, if you take your time and you are quiet when you are putting pressure on you, you can pray, you can meditate, you can ask the Lord, how do I respond to this? What do I say to this? How can I say something here that will be effective and profitable? Profitable to the people and it will not destroy my life or destroy my ministry that time of quietness will prepare you to know what to say and to say the right thing god will help us Amen. let's look at job chapter 34 job chapter 34 we're reading from verse 21 job chapter 34 reading from verse 21 it says in verse 21 job chapter 34 it tells us here for his eyes are upon the ways of man and he sees all his goings there is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves jesus knew their mind he knew their heart he knew their very lives they couldn't hide themselves he didn't say it immediately but when they were putting pressure he now said but you are seen as true but you are rebellious too. But you are, you are disobedient against the word of God too. Okay, if you don't understand that, he that has no sin, let him cast the false stone. Now we're looking at Psalm 44, reading from verse 20. Psalm 44, verse 20. In Psalm 44, verse 20, if we have forgotten the name of our God or stretch out our hands to a strange God, shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. He knoweth the secrets of the heart. Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, he knew the secrets of the hearts of these people. And now he was revealing that when he said, if you don't have any sin, if you have been living perfect as an angel, if you have been living holy and righteous every day and every moment, then you can take the first stone and cast at her. He knew the secrets of the heart of all men. And today he still knows the secrets of the heart of all men. And when we come before him, instead of looking at other people, condemning other people, we should look at our lives and repent and turn away from our sin. And mercy will come to us in Jesus' name. Psalm 139, Psalm 139, he knew their hearts. And he knows the hearts of all people today. Psalm 139, verse 1, O Lord, that was searched me and known me. That's what Jesus did. He knew their heart. And what he said brought conviction to them. That was searched me and known me thou knowest my down sitting 
and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. He knew their thought, he knew their mind, he knew their action, he knew their behavior, he knew their character, he knew their lifestyle. In verse 3, thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. He knows all our ways. And when we try to cover that up, and we're accusing other people as if we're better than those other people, he knows everything about us. And that's why he said, you don't have anything all right, you cut the first tone in verse, uh, in verse 4, for there is not a watch in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Everything we have said, everything we have done, everywhere we have gone, it says, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell behold thou art there if i take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me if i say surely darkness shall cover me even the night shall be light before me yea the darkness hideth not from thee he's saying that whatever we have done in darkness whatever they did in darkness jesus knew everything but the night shineth as the day and the darkness and the light are both alike unto thee and so we understand that jesus christ now spoke to them and said you sinners accused sinner or another sinner and wanting to put another sinner to death what hypocrisy is that romans chapter 2 in romans chapter 2 reading from verse 1 Romans chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man. And all these Pharisees, all these Sadducees, only to accuse and only to condemn, only to criticize. It says, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doeth the same things. Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, they were quick to condemn others, and yet they themselves were secret sinners, and Jesus knew their heart. That's why he put it to them, and then it says they all went away one by one because they were condemned in their conscience. Look at verse 2. But was sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest? them which do such things and doest the same thing that thou shall escape the judgment of God. You know sometimes there are times a father will punish a son and say you're doing that, you're doing that, you're doing that and the son knows that this same father that is punishing him now is doing exactly the same thing. There are times a mother will punish a daughter and say I heard you did this, I heard you went this way, you went that way and uh, punished that daughter and the daughter knows that, you know, mommy too is doing exactly this. The times a pastor, so-called pastor, will say, I stand for the truth, I stand for sound doctrine and when this happens, this must happen and then the people who know that pastor, they say, but look at, you know, so and so, is uh, disciplining people for this and commanding this and correcting this and he himself is guilty of the same thing. There are times a person, a so-called leader, a forsake leader, a backsliding leader will say, I stand for this. And it looks very firm. And it looks like it's a disciplinarian. And yet the thing he's doing is uh, correcting people for is doing the same thing too. That's why the Bible says, do you think, oh man, do you think, O oh pastor, do you think, O oh leader, do you think, father or mother, that judges uh, them, uh, that do such things, and you're doing the same thing, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Judgment is coming, and those who are hypocritically judging other people, and they're living in sin themselves, they're going to be judged on the final day. 
I thought my people would say amen. amen. Look at first John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 20. First John chapter 3. And we're reading here from verse 20. It says in verse 20. For if our heart condemn us. God is greater than our heart. And knoweth all things. God is greater than our hearts. And knoweth all things. Remember what I pointed out to you. That Christ's wise action. Defeated them and distinguished his mastery not only that christ's wise approach destabilized them diverting their attention from the woman to themselves i also said that christ's wise attitude peaceful and poised under persecution gave assurance to those learning from him the truth of heaven that this was the real teacher that came from heaven his wise answer brought undeniable conviction on those accusers who themselves were secret sinners this now is wise admonition confirmed his teaching and serves as warning as we approach the judgment day we're looking at matthew chapter 7 matthew chapter 7 reading from verse 1 matthew chapter 7 verse 1 judge not that she be not judged these people came to judge the woman and he condemned the woman to death they said according to the law of moses this man should be stoned to death and now jesus said okay you don't have any sin because the first stone that judged them and that judgment then drove them out they went out one by one from the elders even to the youngest it's going to happen like that on the final day on the day of record the day of judgment the people who have been very forceful and very fierce and fervent it, all they know is to judge i judge this that's not right i judge this they go about judging 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 and everybody thought they were you know so righteous and pure and holy and perfect on the final day the lord will say okay Okay, all the stones you have thrown, all the people you have cast into fire, all the people you have condemned, all the people you have uh, banished unto, unto death eternal, and they are going to follow after them too. I pray that will not happen to you in Jesus' name. Instead of following people around, and instead of trying to, you know, correct them, control them, criticize them, and destroy them, and all that, why don't we just sit back and look at our lives, and look at what Jesus said, judge not that ye be not judged. For with, this, for with the judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with the measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Give me a good amen. Do you know how we judge, uh, you know, the politicians and we we'll read all this in the papers? They took that kind of money and they took that from the government post. How could they do that? And we're judging, judging, judging. These people who are judging, if you follow them to their office, they're stealing office material. They're taking cars from the, you know, from the office and they're using the car on personal things and that's not the right thing. These people who are judging others, they come late to the place of work they write another time and these people they will have uh, all these ghost workers they prepare accounts and all that for them and they are paying them and they're getting the money and yet when they read anything in the papers that this person took that and this person took that it says that's what we're saying these are the people that have wrecked the country that have ruined the country and i hope this uh, government will be very firm on these corrupt people and get them all away from the system and you are talking about yourself because all the things you are accusing other people of, you're doing some similar things to you in your place of work. And the thing is to come to the Lord and repent and stop judging other people. We judge ourselves. Judge yourself. And as you judge yourself and repent, mercy will come to you. The love of God will flow into your life. And then you stop, you touch the lives of other people, leave them with God, and just say, all I want to do is to be ready when the Lord will come. You'll be ready in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now, the wonderful assurance for converted souls. Wonderful assurance for converted souls. I pray God will give you assurance. I pray God will give you peace of heart. 
this shows us not only the wisdom of Jesus, but the love of Jesus. Not only the love of Jesus, his mercy and compassion. Not only his mercy and compassion, his salvation. His salvation is for everyone. Uh, look up here for a moment. Look at this woman that was taken in the very act of this uh, sin. And they brought the woman to Jesus. And you're thinking, before a woman like this gets saved, this woman will fall on the ground. She will roll on the ground. And she will cry until she loses her voice. She will say, I'm a terrible sinner. I'm a bad sinner. I'm a condemned sinner. I'm the worst sinner. And she will pray and pray and pray. This woman, before this woman can be saved, it should have fasted and fasted. I know I'm wretched. I know I should have died. In fact, I don't marry to live at all. But see the love of Jesus. The woman was standing there. And I'm more thinking, what am I going to do now? Am I going to die like this? No, you will not die eternal life will come unto you because jesus is loving is meek and is merciful and whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved you'll be saved in jesus name it might be an accuser that brought you to jesus salvation will come it might be sickness that brought you to jesus salvation will come it might be suffering that brought you to jesus salvation will come it may be that your life you are fed up with your life and the life is now useless and it's not profitable to you not profitable to anybody but jesus will take this life he recreate this life he refashion this life and today if you'll call on the name of the lord you'll be saved in jesus name look at it now the wonderful assurance for converted souls we're reading from john chapter 8 and we're reading from verses said. 10 and 11 it says that when jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman and he said unto her woman where are those than accusers as nobody condemned thee what he meant is as nobody condemned thee to death by stoning has nobody been able to lift up a stone and throw at you? Has no man condemned thee? And then she said, no man, Lord, no man, Lord, no man, Lord. Now, understand the question. Jesus was not saying, has no man con condemned adultery? Of course, adultery is condemned. Has nobody con condemned fornication? Of course, fornication is condemned. Has nobody condemned sin? Sin is condemned. Has nobody condemned you? Has nobody stoned you? Has nobody consigned you to hell forever? Has nobody been able to destroy you? And she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, tell me. Tell me out loud. Neither do I condemn thee. Hold on, hold on. He didn't say, neither do I condemn adultery. He condemned adultery. Neither do I condemn fornication. He condemned fornication. Neither do I condemn sin. He condemned sin. But neither do I condemn thee. Neither do I stone thee. If there is anybody qualified to stone you, I'm qualified to stone you. Because I said, he that has committed no sin, let him cast the first stone. Look at me here. No one can accuse me of sin. Jesus could have said, and Jesus was pure. Jesus was perfect. Jesus had no sin. If anybody could condemn this woman, Jesus was qualified to condemn this woman. Not only that, the father has committed all judgment into his hand and so if he judge his judgment will be right and because of that he said even all those people now the accusers they are all gone they could not condemn you i that could condemn you i will not condemn you i that could judge you i will not judge you because this the time of judgment has not come this is the time of forgiveness this is the time of salvation and this is the time of cleansing that's why he said neither do i condemn thee go and uh, did he say go and sin more and more because okay neither do i condemn you go and sin more and more is that what he said did he say okay you've done this that's too terrible don't do something that terrible again go and sin less and less did he say that no you see grace was coming to our life 
and the love of God was cleansing her and the power she didn't have before she's going to have the power and the authority she didn't have before she's going to have that authority and the strength to overcome temptation she didn't have before she's going to have the strength that you're having greater strength today a greater power today and greater victory today and so it says neither do i condemn you let the joy of the lord the joy of salvation be your strength and let the joy that now you've got freedom and your joy of getting to heaven let it spoil you up now that you go and sin no more now you say i'm a candidate for heaven no more sinning i'm a candidate in the kingdom of god no more sinning I've experienced the love of Jesus, the Son of God. He loved me. He forgave me. He didn't even ask me, for how long have you been doing this? And how did you get into this kind of life? He just says, neither do I condemn you. And because of that, he loves me. I'm going to love him back. And I'm not going to continue in those things. And then I heard his word. He gave me grace. He gave me strength. He gave me power. He gave me determination. He made me a person that I was I'm proud of myself now. Now there is no condemnation against my life. I don't have anything following after me now. Now I am forgiven. Somebody there, I am forgiven. Now I am cleansed. Somebody there, I am cleansed. Now I am loved by God. I'm loved by Jesus. Somebody there. And because of that, he said, yes, I'm going to go out now and live a different life. You live a different life. You live a gracious life and you live a righteous life in Jesus' name. Go and sin no more. Look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 17. John chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 17. John chapter 3. Reading from verse what? reading from verse 17 it says in verse 17 for god sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved and this woman a worldly man a worldly woman a sinful woman she was not going to be condemned by christ but to be saved by christ and thank god that salvation is yours too we're looking at Romans chapter 8 and reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. There is therefore when? Now at this time no condemnation. When all your sins are forgiven and you have the loving voice of Jesus saying neither do I condemn you go and sin no more. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. Made me free. Tell the Lord, made me free from the law of sin and death. We're coming back to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And we're reading from verse 11. She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Tell me. Go and sin no more. Grace came to her. Grace will come to you strength will come to you Amen. power will come to you Amen. and god will not allow any temptation beyond your strength to come to you Amen. you will be an overcomer in jesus name Amen. john chapter 5 we're reading from verse 14 john chapter 5 verse 14 after what jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him behold thou art made whole you are made whole Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. You see that when the grace of God comes to us, when the salvation of God comes to us, the power to live in righteousness also comes to us. Go and sin no more. We're looking at Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, reading from verses 1 and 2, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Look at verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. You will not continue in sin. 
For he that is dead is freed from sin. Look at verse 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore, let not sin therefore, reign in your mortal body that ye should obey each in the laws thereof. Look at verse 18. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Verse 22. Being now and now be made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. The Lord will accomplish it in every life in Jesus' name. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And we're reading here from verse 22. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. That he put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful laws, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Renewal is coming to you. And righteousness is coming to you. In verse 24, and that she put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. In verse 28, let him that, let him that stole, what do we do now? Still no more. Let him that fought, fight no more. Let him that lied, lie no more. Let him that was immoral, be immoral no more. A change has come. Amen. New life has come. Amen. And that new life will see you through to heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies, and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that she may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. That woman tasted that the Lord is gracious. I'm forgiven. He's overlooked everything I did in the past. He said, neither do I condemn you. And now I'm going to go out and live in newness of life. And if that woman died at that time, where would she go? heaven everything every bad thing she had uh, done will be totally forgotten the same thing with us today because jesus christ is the same yesterday today and forever he's saying i'm not coming to kill you to destroy you to throw you to hell now neither do i condemn you receive grace are you receiving grace tonight yeah. where are you there you receive the grace of god yeah. go and sin no more let there be an amen in your life. Amen. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The grace of God is there. The mercy of God is there. There's no condemnation today. And there's no death penalty today. And there's uh, no casting to hell today. Mercy is available today. You've got the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God. Go and sin no more.